Hi everyone, this is Kalyan Kumar once again and uh, welcome back to Chemistry Universe. We have done part one of alkenes, which was introduction and preparation of alkenes. And in this part, we are going to look at in detail all the physical and chemical properties of alkenes. And at the outset, let me tell you, this is going to be a very long video. So you might uh, end up watching it in installments. But again, as I always repeatedly say, make sure that you take notes. Uh, while you are uh, watching this video and whenever a question is given, pause the video, uh, do the question on your own and then play the video back to check your uh, answer. So, and play it at any speed that you like. Uh, I will be putting the timestamps of each and every reaction that I'm going to do uh, in the uh, section below. So, with that uh, being said, let us uh, start the video. This is alkenes part two, and this is physical and chemical properties. All right, so here we go. So let's start with the physical properties. Now, these are the things that you have to remember. The first three alkenes are gases. The next 14 are liquids and the higher ones are solids. And this basically means that uh, C1 to C3 are gases and uh, C4 to C17 are liquids and anything greater than C18 is going to be solid. But of course, remember, as you uh, make more and more uh, branching, it is possible that uh, some of the C4 uh, may end up becoming gases because branching will decrease the van der Waals forces. And uh, the, they are colorless and odorless, uh, except for ethylene, which has a sweet smell. Practically insoluble in water because we know they are uh, non-polar, but fairly soluble in non-polar solvents like benzene, petroleum, ether, etc. As polarity increases, solubility in polar solvents will increase. We know that. And uh, we have done an isomerism. Generally, solubility of cis is more than trans in polar solvents because in trans, the dipole moment generally is lower than the dipole moment of cis, but not always true. So most often than not, cis has a greater dipole moment and therefore that would tend to dissolve in polar solvents a little more than trans. Generally for uh, compounds like a CAB, double bond CAB, you have a dipole moment of cis more than trans. That is of course because in the trans, the A's will get cancelled and the B's will get cancelled. And uh, the melting point uh, increases as molecular mass increases. And we know that more packing efficiency means more melting point and trans has more symmetry than this. We have done all of these things in isomerism. A uh, boiling point increases as molecular weight increases because that would increase uh, the surface area. Generally branching decreases the boiling point because it's decreasing the surface area while polarity increases the boiling point. All of these things we know generally boiling point of this again is more than trans because of greater dipole moment. And last physical property is generally trans is more stable than cis as cis has more steric repulsion. Again, this is something which I'm sure we all are aware of. Now let's get on to the important part, the chemical properties. Now, uh, what you need to understand in chemical properties is that alkenes are more reactive than benzene towards electrophilic reagents. In benzene, there is a circular closed loop pi electron cloud, which means the pi electron cloud is not that much exposed. Whereas in the case of alkenes, the pi electron clouds are very much exposed and therefore uh, they are more uh, reactive towards electrophilic reagents. Now alkenes are more reactive than, uh, sorry, it's uh, at, than alkenes of course, because the pi electrons of the double bond are located much uh, far from the carbon nuclei and are thus firmly bound to them. Pi bond is weaker than sigma bond and more easily broken. So obviously we know that alkenes are more reactive than alkenes. And the reactivity order of alkenes is inversely related to the stability. Uh, because uh, more hyperconjugation implies more stable the alkene is, more stable the alkene is, less reactive it will be. Greater the steric hindrance, uh, more unstable the alkene will be and more will be the uh, reactivity. And these are reflected in the heat of combustion and uh, heat of hydrogenation of isomeric alkenes. And uh, for example, look at this table. And you will notice here 
that I'm looking at a, a various alkenes here, heat of combustion in kJ per mole and heat of hydrogenation in kJ per mole. And you will notice that isobutene uh, among all uh, butenes is most stable. You see, isobutene is basically, um, isobutene is basically CH3, C, CH3, double bond CH2. It's got six hyperconjugated structures and all the six hyperconjugation will make the primary carbon negative. That makes isobutene most stable. And remember, all these combustion hydrogenation, they are exothermic reactions, which means the products are lower than the reactants. Now, if you look at heat of combustion, at least you can understand that if I take isomeric alkenes, the number of CO2 and water molecules produced would be same. So the product's energy would remain the same. Whereas the reactant's energy will keep changing depending on the nature of the uh, alkene. And as low as the energy is, lesser would be the difference and lesser will be the heat of combustion. So stability increase means lowest heat of combustion. And hydrogenation is 27.2. Now if you look at uh, transbutene, this is less stable than isobutene. It has relatively more heat of combustion and heat of hydrogenation. And uh, cis is of course even less stable than trans to more heat. And bute one is the least stable to so got the maximum heat. So more unstable the alkene is more energy it will release in combustion. And then if you look at the stability order of some of the alkenes, you know, of course, hyperconjugation plays a role here. And this order is completely based on hyperconjugation and therefore the reactivity also will depend on that. Now, alkenes uh, give the following type of reactions, addition, oxidation, substitution, polymerization, and isomerization. So first, let's look at addition reaction. Now, what I'm about to show you is something which I've already done in electromeric effect in uh, general organic chemistry. Now, in this, what happens is that we are going to show how an alkene polarizes an existing molecule, neutral molecule, uh, and they've and ends up reacting with it and this is the typical reaction of uh, alkenes so first showing electromeric effect to polarize the uh, reagent and then reacting with it okay so if you take these are generally electrophilic addition reactions you have alkene you have b and e let's say e is the electrophilic part b is the basic part that means b is more electronegative than e so these are electrons and these are electrons and E will anyway have a delta plus because of less electronegativity. B will have a delta negative and this delta plus would tend to orient itself towards the alkene because of the pi electron attraction. Now what happens is that this attraction keeps on increasing. B e keeps coming down and as it keeps coming down because of the repulsion of the pi electron to these sigma electrons, they get pushed towards B and uh, a situation arises where the EB bond breaks heterolytically like this. And then of course the E plus may wander towards one of the carbon atoms. It will start pulling electrons from that. That carbon will start pulling electrons from its adjacent carbon. The pi bond breaks and forms a bond with E and this carbon, the adjacent carbon becomes plus. And of course B minus comes and attacks that and forms a bond. So this is how an alkene is able to react with another molecule. So let's look at some of the examples of this. The first is addition of halogen in CCl4. Meaning if you take an alkene and add halogen in a non-polar solvent, you get this. Just look at the reaction first. Now you must understand that as I said, alkenes are uh, more reactive than benzene. Uh, because of uh, greater pi electron cloud. Uh, the, the greater uh, surface area of the pi electron cloud available. Now what you also need to understand here is that uh, a molecule like bromine, which has no electronegativity difference between the two atoms, even that ha is polarized by an alkene. The alkene is so electron rich, it can polarize Br2 into Br plus and Br minus using the same effect I showed you in the case of Eb that is electromeric effect. The solvent we have used is non-polar. So this indicates one 
particular thing and that is that even in a non polar solvent an alkene is able to break a molecule into plus and minus so that's how polarizing it is so of course one may wonder what would happen if i use a polar solvent well obviously it will be able to break the br2 much more easily but there the product also changes because the solvent being polar it can also tend to act as a nucleophile so that we will do after this first let's understand what happens in a non polar solvent so it's an addition reaction we call it an electrophilic addition reaction okay so alkenes react rapidly with a halogen molecule in a non polar solvent at room temperature and in the absence of light the product is a vicinal dihalide if bromine in cl4 is added to an alkene the red brown color of bromine disappears almost instantly as long as the alkene is present in excess this serves as a test for the detection of unsaturation of alkene in alkyne so bromine is brown colored uh, liquid and uh, when it reacts with the alkene the brown color disappears we are not taking pure bromine we are taking a solution of bromine in cl4 so that is brown colored and uh, as bromine keeps reacting assuming the alkene is in excess uh, it the, the bromine will eventually react completely and disappear and the solution becomes colorless remember this is a test for both alkenes and alkynes it is not possible to test them separately we cannot find out whether it is alkene or alkyne but we can definitely say that it can't be an alkene because alkene won't react like this without the presence of sunlight so here is the mechanism step 1 the bromine molecule becomes polarized as it approaches the alkene as i said br plus and br minus in step 2 the polarized bromine molecule transfers a positive bromine atom with six electrons to the alkene resulting in the formation of a cyclic bromonium ion complex now if you remember i have already discussed this in alkyl halides that if you have an alkene and you have an electrophile especially an electrophile which has lone pair then what happens is this bond goes to carbon this attacks br plus and once it attacks the br plus the b up the positive charge vanishes but since this carbon becomes plus and there's a lone pair available very near to it it will attack the carbon forming a three membered cyclic bromonium ion now whenever an electrophile has a lone pair it immediately attacks the electrophilic carbon to form a three membered intermediate which we've already discussed now in the next step also something that we have discussed the attack of the br minus ion on the cyclic ion takes place from the side opposite to side where bromine atom is already present in order to minimize steric hindrance this is sn2 with sn1 character we have discussed this also before because what happens is once this is positively charged it tends to break one of the bonds uh, so that the positive charge can dissipate so if, when it has an option of taking uh, from this bond and this bond it will prefer this bond because the delta plus here that is arising can be easily compensated by the r so what will happen is this bond will start breaking but it does not completely break because br minus always attacks from the opposite side so that implies this bond has not completely broken but br minus attacks only this carbon that is because it is this bond which is being broken more than this bond as the delta plus here is more stable so it is called sn2 with sn1 character we have discussed this in alkyl halides and you get a dibromo product and this kind of a carbon that is uh, having a delta plus is called a pseudo carbocation or a non classical carbocation and as you can see it's an anti addition one br from one side another br from another side reactivity is on in this order because cl plus will be more reactive than br plus addition of f2 is extremely exothermic and therefore it is difficult to control so we don't do f2 like this and as you can see i plus is going to be extremely low in reactivity so it is better to use um, I2 reacts slowly with alkenes to form vicinal dihalides which are unstable and eliminate I2 to give back the alkene it's not easy to do the reaction with I2 so here we are going to define a rule called the markovnikov's rule now what you need to understand is that uh, now now we know the mechanism of each of the electrophilic reactions of alkenes right 
So using the mechanism, we can make the product. And that is the way we should actually make the product. But sometimes it is easier to follow some rules which are based on these, uh, which of course were invented at the time when mechanisms were not known just to help people make the major product easily, uh, which to quite an extent work even now, but have to be used carefully because um, since we, now we know the mechanism, it is always better to use the mechanism to make the product. Now, the first rule, the, the rule that we're going to talk about is called a Markovnikov's rule. Now, what this rule says is that if you have an unsymmetrical alkene, and that means by unsymmetrical, I mean uh, the two carbons, the, the carbons which are having double bond, the vinylic carbons, have different amount of hydrogens in them. Then the negative part of the adding molecule will always go to the carbon with less number of hydrogen. As you can see here, the Br- minus attack the middle carbon, right? So if the Br- minus attack the middle carbon, wasn't that the carbon with less H? It had a R. Whereas the carbon on its right side had 2H already. So based on that principle, we can conclude that this makes sense to say the negative part goes to the carbon with less H because the one with the less H will be having more hyperconjugation for a carbocation or a pseudo carbocation. You will have a more inductive effect. And therefore, uh, this rule does work. Uh, but of course, one must use it cautiously. So here we have the Makonikov's rule when molecule of polar reagents of general structure Y plus Z minus such as HX, water, etc. add on an unsymmetrical unsaturated hydrocarbon the negative part of the molecule goes to the carbon bearing less number of hydrogen atoms. Of course, uh, in, 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 in this particular case one may argue that since both of them were BR what does Markonikov rule mean? But the fact of the matter is, remember the Br- minus was the one that attacked the middle carbon, not the end carbon, even though the end result might have been same because eventually both were Br. But then if both of them are not the same atom, that would then make a difference, right? So this rule works. Okay. The addition of halogen molecule to alkene is an example of Markovnikov's addition. Now let's look at the stereochemistry. Since we know it is anti-addition. So I want you to pause the video now. I want you to add the bromine anti one from top, one from the bottom and then make the Fisher projection of the product. So what happens is that I'm just going to turn this alkene a little bit here. So here is the answer. I'm going to make this alkene something like this. Now here I'm going to make one carbon attack the Br from the bottom and the other carbon is being attacked from the Br on top and you get a sawhorse like this. And this, and now I'm going to bring both the CH3s down to make the Fisher projection. And then using this, I am able to make the Fisher projection like this. And as you will notice, this is not a meso compound. It's a compound that is optically active. But of course, you will get both NN tumors because uh, he, he, here I attack the BR from the bottom and here from the top, it could have been the other way around. And in which case I would get the mirror image of this, which is also optically active, but is an NN tumor of this. It's not superimposable. So, yeah. Now here, of course, if I were to add ICL, what do you think would be the product? Pause the video, make the product and then check your answer. So here is the solution. How does ICL break? ICL will break as I plus and CL minus. So according to Markovnikov rule, where will the CL minus go? To the carbon with less H. Now let's take addition of halogen in water. So what happens if the solvent is polar? Of course, the reaction of halogen will be faster. The reaction of halogen X2 in water or even HOX follows anti and Makarnikov's addition. It's not anti Makarnikov's addition. It is anti addition just like uh, the halogen and, and Makarnikov's addition. The difference between uh, the addition in CCL4 and water is that in the last step, the nucleophile attacks, attacking is water instead of X minus. So this is what I was talking about. If you take a polar solvent, the polar solvent would tend to have lone pairs. And that would mean that in the second step where the Br- minus attacked, you could have the solvent which is polar itself attacking and since solvent is in greater amount, the chances of it attacking is always greater than Br- minus attacking. So if you take Br2 and water, Br2 will break into Br- minus and Br+. Plus. Br- plus will form the ring. In the second step, instead of Br- minus attacking, 
I mean, I'm not saying it won't attack, but less probability. Water would attack the middle carbon, which means instead of having two BRs or two carbons, you will find the middle carbon having the OH and the terminal carbon having the BR. That would be the major product. Of course, dibromo will also be a minor product there. Okay, so if you do this, this is what you get. Water acts as nucleophile since it is in excess, and uh, X two in water can also be written as H O X because that's what happens. And reactivity is H O C L more than H O B R more than H O I because remember C L plus is C L being more electronegative is more reactive than B R plus than I plus. All right. So let's take an example. Now I want you to pause this video now, and I want you to look at this reaction and tell me what all will be the product. There are three products I've listed. The alkene is being reacted with Br two. It is put in water, which contains NaCl. Now the first you need to understand, and that is that electrophile you will get only from. So here is the solution, by the way. The electrophile you'll get only is for from Br. You cannot get electrophile anywhere else. So Br plus will attack and will form a ring. Now what all can act as a nucleophile? Br minus can act as a nucleophile. Cl minus can act as a nucleophile. Water can act as a nucleophile, which is why you get three products. In one case, Br acts as a nucleophile, so you get a Br here. In the other case, you'll get a Cl here. In the other case, you'll get OH here. So you get three products, two BRs, Cl and Br, OH and Br. Now let's check out addition of halogen acids. Now addition of HX on unsymmetrical alkenes takes place according to Markovnikov's rule. Now here it is much more easier to understand because what happens is, again, if you use the Markovnikov rule, you can get this product. But if you look at the mechanism, it will be much more easier to understand why. Because what happens is. That first the alkene will take the electrophile H plus, and since H does not have a lone pair, is not going to form a ring. It is going to form a carbocation. And which carbocation do you think is most stable? The middle one or the terminal one? Obviously the middle one, which is why the bond is moving to the terminal one, and that is taking the H plus. And once this is formed, the Cl minus will attack if you are adding HCl, and you will get this product. And since carbocation is formed, rearrangement, if it is possible. It will happen, and uh, in case of rearrangement, is not possible. The major product will be according to the Markovnikov's rule. Now, if uh, the carbon where the uh, if the carbon where the nucleophilic halide ion attacks becomes chiral, and no other carbon is chiral, then a pair of anion chromos are formed as a carbocation is planar. This I'm sure you can understand. So let's do a couple of examples. So add HCl to this. Pause the video, make the product, and play the video back. So obviously, the answer is that you will find the Markovnikov's rule, and you will get this. Okay, how about this one? Now here I made sure both of them have the same number of H. So you have to use the mechanism to form this. So pause the video, make the product. Now remember, you need to find out which carbocation is stable. Is the left stable or the right stable? Some of you will say right is stable because of greater I effect, but remember left is more stable because of greater hyperconjugation. And hyperconjugation, remember, is a stronger effect. So H will go here, and the Br will go here. Try this one. Pause the video, make the product, play it back. Now, which carbocation is more stable? Again, some of you will pre prefer this one. But this carbocation is actually more stable because it is undergoing lone pair resonance. So this will take the H, and this will take the Br. Try this again. Figure out which carbocation is stable. This carbocation will be stable because once this goes here and takes the H, now this carbon has got three hyperconjugation as well as some plus M of Cl, even though its minus I is dominant. But it will give you some amount of electrons, so the I will go to the middle carbon. But remember, it is a carbocation stability which decides. So if I take this, 
Where do you think the H will go? Now, if the pi bond goes here and this takes the H, I get a plus here and I've got three hyperconjugation. If the pi bond goes here and this takes the H, I get a plus here and this has only two H for hyperconjugation. And therefore, you will find the left carbocation is more stable. And order of reactivity of HX are like this. Now comes addition of HBr with peroxide. Now this is something which you have to remember and uh, learn. It's quite an important reaction. And that is that, uh, you see, uh, when you add HBr under polar conditions, you find the Markovnikov product as the major product. But if you add it under peroxide, you get a free radical reaction wherein the product is an anti Markovnikov product. So the first thing you have to understand is HBr under polar condition is normal Markovnikov product. Under peroxide, anti Markovnikov product. Mechanism, free radical. And this only happens with HBr, not with HCl, HI or HF. All the other three, even with peroxide, will give you Markovnikov product. But only HBr will give you the anti Markovnikov product. So first let's check out how this is formed. And then let's find out why only for HBr. Okay. Now the addition of uh, HBr to propene under polar conditions in the absence of peroxide yields 2 bromopropane, which is of course according to Markovnikov rule. However, in the presence of peroxide or under other conditions that promote radical formation, the addition proceeds via a rapid chain reaction to yield 1 bromopropane. This addition of HBr on unsaturated, unsymmetrical compounds takes place contrary to Markovnikov's rule. This addition of HBr in the presence of peroxide is generally referred to as the peroxide effect or Harash effect, leading to anti Markovnikov addition, proposed by Morris Selege Harash in 1933. He was the first one who studied this. So basically, if you take propene, Markovnikov rule will suggest the Br will go to the middle carbon. But you get under peroxide the anti Markovnikov product with peroxide. So let's understand the reaction. Now, first the chain initiation step. The peroxide is the one that generates the radicals. Now, and this bond is very weak. OO bond, as you know, is very weak because of the lone pair, lone pair repulsion. It is only 35 kilocalories. Then the RO dot reacts with HBr. It takes an H and gives you a bromine atom. And this happens because the OH bond is stronger than the OBR bond. Now once the Br dot forms, now comes the propagation step. That is the alkene. The Br dot attacks. Now what the Br dot does is it breaks the pi bond and makes sure that both of these two become radical. Now out of this radical which is secondary and this radical which is primary, which is more stable? Secondary. Which is more reactive? Primary. So it will react with the primary radical to give effectively a secondary radical. So you get this. Now once the secondary radical is formed, it is going to react with HBr and it will take an H and form the product and bromine atom and the propagation keeps on happening. And this happens because the CH bond is actually stronger than CBR bond. You don't get a dibromo product because CH is stronger than CBR. So that tells you why HBR reacts the way it does to give you the anti of product. It is through the free radical mechanism. Bromine atom attacks and attacks the more reactive radical that is primary and gives rise to the secondary radical which means the, the bromine will automatically go to the carbon with more H. Now let us understand why does it happen only with HBr and not with the other halogen acids. Okay, HBr is the only one of the four hydrogen halides that will add readily to alkenes via a radical pathway. The reason for this is reflected in the delta H values for the two steps of the chain reaction for addition of HX2 uh, alkene. Now, this is very important to understand. Now, just imagine this. And I'll show you that in a short while. What was the first propagation step? The first propagation step was alkene. I'm talking about propagation step. Alkene reacting with Br dot. Pi bond of the alkene breaks. 
and the br dot reacts with one of the carbon atoms to give rise to the other radical wherever br attacks the other one becomes a radical if you were to take hcl don't you think that ccl bond will actually be stronger than a cbr bond because cl is smaller in size if you take hf wouldn't the cf bond be stronger than even the ccl bond and if you take hi wouldn't the ci bond be weaker than any of these halogen bonds because as the size of the atom increases the bond strength will decrease so for the first propagation step remember in all the in in all the halogen acids in the propagation step the first one the pi bond of the alkene is getting broken which means it is same for all the halogen acids the only difference is the c halogen bond formed so bond breaking energy that you need to give will remain the same pi bond but the bond making energy don't you think hf will be most exothermic because cf bond is stronger so cf so for hf this will be most exothermic and for hi it is possible it could even be endothermic and th these are the values that you get so this is what i am talking about so obviously x being smaller you will always find hf will be most exothermic and this is the delta h values hf is negative 188 hcl is negative 109 hbr is negative 21 hi in fact is 29 can you understand that ci bond sigma is weaker than a pi bond which also begs the question that if anybody asks you that sigma bond is stronger than pi bond you can't say yes you need to specify which sigma bond and which pi bond ci sigma bond is weaker than cc pi bond now let's look at the second pr propagation step in the second propagation step this radical breaks the hx bond takes the h and gives x dot now which hx is easy to break hi hbr hcl hf which bond is weaker obviously hi so for hi the bond energy to be given will be less whereas the bond formed in all cases will be same because it is going to take a ch only the c will take a h only so hf breaking will be most difficult hcl will be next hbr will be next and most easy is hi so this reaction will be definitely exothermic for this and possibly endothermic for this in fact these two are exo and these two two are endo this is what you get hf is positive hcl is positive hbr and hi are negative now don't you notice that hbr is negative in both cases whereas hf and hcl are negative here but positive here hi is negative here but positive here and you know that delta g is delta h minus t delta s if delta s b is, is assumed to be same for all all the halogen acids it is all a function of delta h so what happens is for this reaction the delta h of these two is positive so that makes delta g positive of course we don't know the value of delta s but we have to assume it is in such a way that del this delta h positive makes this this delta g positive whereas in this reaction the delta h of hi is positive so that makes the delta g of hi positive for this step meaning it is only hbr that is negative in both cases which would enable its delta g to be negative in both cases which is why for hbr it is possible so only for hbr both steps are exothermic for others heat has to be given at least in one step that is hbr with peroxide the next one is addition of sulfuric acid now this eventually leads to alcohol alkenes react with concentrated sulfuric acid to produce alkyl hydrogen sulfates which give alcohol on hydrolysis this reaction is used to separate an alkene from a mixture of alkane and alkene so you have alkene you have sulfuric acid first again makonikov addition 1h will go to the terminal carbon and the h so4 will go to the uh, middle carbon and eventually this will turn into oh in the presence of water water is a better nucleophile and this is a very good leaving group nucleophilic substitution will occur and you will get oh here then comes addition of water now again makonikov addition propene and higher alkenes react with water in the presence of an acid to form an alcohol this reaction is known as hydration reaction 
intermediate in this is a carbocation so rearrangement may take place so very simple you add water in the presence of h plus first it will react with h plus just look at the products marconic of products and mechanism i'm sure you understand it will uh, move here it will take h plus it will become plus water will attack and then release the h plus which is why you get the marconic of product wherever the carbocation is more stable so here what do you think will be the product pause obviously the carbocation on the right side is more stable that is the one that is going to get the oh next you have a oxymeric relation demeric relation now in the sixth example we looked at addition of water and we said uh, that in the addition of water the product is alcohol but it is a rearranged alcohol in case rearrangement is possible but if you want a marconic of product without rearrangement then you do this one that is called oxymeric equation demeric equation all right so product is alcohol just like addition of water major product is marconic of product no rearrangement therefore no carbonium ion formation so what happens is please understand it's actually a combination of two reactions this is not a one single reaction first reaction is oxymeric equation second reaction is demeric equation again remember these are not two steps you see number of steps of a reaction doesn't matter it is called a single reaction but these are two separate individual reactions so if you do oxymeric equation you do it in the presence of a mercuric ion we call it oxymeric equation we generally use thf as solvent and here what happens is the middle carbon gets the oh and the terminal carbon becomes hgoac it's called oxymeric equation so if somebody were to ask you the product of oxymeric equation you will say this is the product whereas when you react it further with nabh4 the second reaction demeric equation the hgoac becomes h so let's look at the mechanism here mercuric acetate in water is treated with an alkene the addition product on reduction with sodium borohydride in aqueous NaOH solution gives alcohol it follows makarnikov's rule so first let's look at mechanism of oxymeric equation hgoac twice breaks into hgoac plus and aco minus now this guy this plus guy remember hg is a lone pair okay so again this will attack the with this bond goes to carbon this attacks the hg hg has a lone pair attacks this carbon back you get a three membered cyclic intermediate with the positive charge again you have sn2 with sn1 character uh, and remember it's th of water which is the solvent the water attacks this middle carbon this goes here and this is what you get as the product of oxymeric equation when it comes to demercuration it's a little uh, tricky mechanism this is the reactant when you add nabh4 it gives you h minus this attacks the hg and the oac leaves and you get hg h bond and then homolytic breaking will occur hg and h will break homolytically c and hg will break homolytically and hg will get its lone pair back so you get the removal of mercury and carbon and hydrogen both end up becoming an atom and a radical and they will join to form ch2 and of course ch3 and the hydrogen atom remember is abstracted by carbon from the same side as hg so whichever side hg attacks you will get the same thing now what you need to understand here is that if you have an alkene and if i do oxymeric equation demeric equation and the ask you the product remember what happens is the oh attacks the carbon from the side opposite to hg right so if hg is top this will attack from bottom right now this is formed now once this is formed this can rotate remember it's a single bond so this hg can remain on top can come at the bottom this is bottom let's say and this can also go on top and bottom so what i'm trying to say is that eventually when h attacks hg it will attack from the same side of hg and it attacks the h from the same side of hg can you see that so what i'm trying to say is that in the eventual product the h and the oh could be on the same side 
or could be on the opposite side now in this case instead of h i am using d so don't you think i'll get these two products where the o o h and the h are on the same side and the o h and the d are on the opposite side that is because once oxymeric relation occurs this bond becomes single and rotation is possible the reason i'm telling you this is because if it is a ring in oxymeric relation after oxymeric relation even though the bond becomes single it cannot rotate because it is still a ring meaning that these two will be from the opposite side because remember oh attacks from the bottom hg is on top and the d will come from the same side as hg so means d is top and oh is bottom which means they will be on the opposite side because here the single bond rotation is not free now if instead of water instead of using water which is why i am getting the oh if i were to use alcohol won't i get a or here look at the mechanism and that will be called alkoxy mercuration demercuration and that leads to an alcohol the next is called hydroboration oxidation and here is where you get an anti marconic of alcohol so you had addition of water giving you a marcon uh, a marconic of product and a rearranged product if possible you had oxy mercuration demercuration where only marconic of product is formed no rearrangement and now you have hydroboration oxidation which where again an alcohol is formed the product alcohol is an anti marconic of alcohol so let's check this out but unlike the previous two this gives you an anti marconic of product and this is a little weird because here we say the addition is marconic of but the product is anti marconic of hydroboration oxidation that sounds a little weird and we'll just uh, have a look at why it is so okay so though the product is anti marconic of the addition to the alkene is marconic of so you have an alkene you have bh3 you have a solvent and again this is a combination of two reactions remember hydroboration and oxidation are separate reactions hydroboration so what happens is bh3 loses one h and that h attacks the middle carbon and the b on the terminal carbon this is actually a marconic of addition because in bh3 the negative is h and b is positive so if i were to align b here and h here and i say b attacks here and h attacks here isn't it marconic of addition negative going to the carbon with less h is a different matter here that the negative is h so far it wasn't it was the positive one but now it's a negative one so addition is marconic of and then remember it has got two more h so it can do two similar alkene attacks so eventually 3h will react with three alkenes to give you trialkyl borane you see this three times on boron and then in the second step oxidation these three will react with h2o2 and the b will become oh so whichever carbon had the b gets the oh again let's look at the mechanism that will make it easier to understand first hydroboration so you have the alkene you have bh3 remember bh3 in uh, of course always exists as b2h6 so in reactions they may write b2h6 is means the same thing pi bond breaks attacks b this bond breaks attacks carbon isn't it a marconic of addition and the boron has two more hydrogens two more alkenes trialkyl borane this is trialkyl borane this is the product of the first step not the first step first reaction hydroboration now comes the second reaction oxidation now this mechanism you need not uh, re remember because it's not required but it's just to give you an idea to, to make it easier for you to understand so this trialkyl borane remember we use h2o2 with naoh NaOH picks up one of the H of the H2O2 and gives you a hydroperoxide ion, and it attacks the electrophilic boron. Boron has remember has an empty p orbital, and you get this. Now, from here, OH minus will leave, giving you a very unstable O plus intermediate. 
and just like in carbocation rearrangement one of the bc bond will break and it will do a rearrangement so the carbon comes on o and as you know this will happen in all the uh, in the other two as well other two alkyl groups so all of them are joined with o to boron that is where they get their o from and now the reaction is not complete now oh minus comes attacks boron again it becomes minus now the bo bond breaks making o as negative and this o negative formed and the resultant would be this now this being a strong base it will take the oh from here the, the h from here and form the alcohol and similarly two more oh minuses will attack so you will get two more alkoxides and you will get h3bo3 so totally there are three alkoxides so all these three alkoxides will take the 3h you will get bo3 3 minus and remember all the oh minuses that have come have come from na oh so their na will satisfy the bo3 3 minus so you get three alcohols and na3 bo3 now this is a syn addition because the h and the boron attack from the same side then peroxide ion attacks b after this the alkyl group shifts from b to o shifting also occurs from the same side and we know that in rearrangement when a group shifts it will leave an attack from the same side of the alkyl group so basically what we are saying is eventually the alcohol in the alcohol the oh and the h are attacking from the same side so if it ever were to occur in a ring remember you have to make the h and the oh on the same side now if suppose after getting the trialkyl borane if we use an acid in step 3 instead of oxidation then we will get an alkane meaning you get these three alkenes and bh3 you get a trialkyl borane remember no i don't do oxidation i simply react with acid remember in the bc bond again c is delta minus and b is delta plus So if I reacted with acid, wouldn't the carbon take the H? What would it form? It will form an alkane. So this is a very beautiful method of making an alkane from an alkene without doing catalytic hydrogenation. Now again, you may wonder that okay, fine, we can get it, but how does it help us? We any we can anyway get an alkane by doing hydrogenation. You can because this is the way you do it. You have a particular alkene. and let's say that alkene has double bonds in two positions one is a hindered double bond the other is a unhindered double bond and you bring a bh3 without two with, without 3h you have two of the h replaced by bulky groups bulky alkyl groups and only one h is left and your compound has two alkenes remember one unhindered one hindered so where would this hindered boron compound attack on the unhindered alkene that makes sense right on the unhindered alkene so on the unhindered alkene it will attack so as it attacks the unhindered alkene that's where all the reaction is going to happen so the hindered alkene is left free so it is possible to do hydrogenation selectively let's check it out okay so here we go This is an effective method for hydrogenation of an alkene without using molecular H2 with catalyst. How does it help? Well, trialkyl boranes, where at least two alkyl groups are highly hindered, cannot react on a hindered double bond. This means we can selectively make an anti-Makarnikov's alcohol on an unhindered double bond and also reduce the unhindered double bond selectively. Say, for example, I have this. I am treating it with this. Can you see this is hindered? This is a hindered double bond. This is unhindered double bond. Where do you think this will attack? It has only one H anyway. So where do you think it will attack? It will only attack the top one. Now, if you do H two O two OH minus, B will be replaced by OH. Can you see you have selectively made one double bond as alcohol and not the other? And if you selectively add H plus, won't you get this? Right, so that is how you do it. 
the next reaction is hydro formulation or oxo process there's a gap here now alkenes react with carbon monoxide and hydrogen at 100 to 150 degree celsius and the high pressure in the presence of cobalt catalyst to produce an aldehyde there's no mechanism for this you just have to remember the reaction you have an alkene you react it with co and h2 high t high p and uh, so you get this product a cho gets attached next is called a dimerization reaction now in the presence of sulfuric acid or h2 h3po4 dimerization of isobutylene takes place to give you two isomer of octene what does it mean it means this that you take isobutene sulfuric acid 80 degree it dimerizes to give you this and this how did it happen i want you to pause the video and i want you to think carefully and try to get your own mechanism this is how things work you have to use your own brain and not simply look at the video for everything pause the video try to get the mechanism there is a there are two mole of alkene there is h plus available so how would they dimerize just think about it try to get the mechanism on your own and see whether you're able to get these two product and then once you have done some work then you can play the video back to get the solution so here is the solution all right so the mechanism goes like this you have an alkene and you have an electrophile h plus well as you know this will happen so this becomes a carbocation now this carbocation acts as an electrophile to the other alkene and there also you will get a, the, the pi bond will move to the terminal carbon it will attack this carbon and you will get again a carbocation now it will lose one of the h either from here or from here to get an alkene which is why you got two products if it loses from the terminal one you will get the first product if it loses from the right one it will you will get this product obviously this will be major more hyperconjugation so i want you to do one example one on your own okay pause the video take as much time as it takes but make sure you have to get the right one now remember here one mole of alkene is given which means in it's a diene in fact so anyway there are two double bonds so two double bonds implies it's like two alkenes so obviously it will be intramolecular dimerization now i want you to think about it and do it on your own pause the video now and the product is this one how did i get this well this is the way it goes so what will happen the h plus comes here wouldn't this break and this take the h plus so where will you get a carbocation you will get a carbocation here and this will become ch2 ch2 that is this one ch2 that is this one then a ch and then a double bond c with two mes so this will act as a uh electrophile for this so this pi bond will move here and it will attack this carbon you'll get a five membered ring 1 2 3 4 5 you get a five membered ring right with the one of the carbons having two mes it is joined to a carbon which has a c and two mes outside and having a plus five membered ring with a positive outside so this bond will break because it's a tertiary carbon shift and this will join here so basically what i'm getting is i am getting c 2 me it is joined here um no i think i missed one carbon here so it is going to be like this one isn't it 1 2 3 4 5 6 6 membered ring and the plus here basically what i'm getting is i'm getting a six membered ring with two mes two mes and a plus here now it will undergo a methyl shift so it will undergo a methyl shift how how many hyperconjugation it has it has four now suppose it has one more methyl shift 
let's check if it has one more methyl shift the plus will go here how much hyper conjugation it has now it has got 5 3 plus 2 5 as opposed to 4 here so wouldn't this carbocation be more stable now there is no h on this carbon there is only h on this carbon so it will eliminate from here which is why you get this product All right. The next reaction is addition of HCN. It is similar. Makonikov addition. Pause the video. Make the product. Play it back. Obviously, you'll get this one. Then addition of NOCl, which is the Tilden's reagent. Again, remember it is NO plus and Cl minus. You just have to make the product. You don't have to do anything else. Though I'm giving you the mechanism. Addition of Tilden's reagent on non-symmetrical alkene follows the Makonikov's rule, but no rearrangement occurs as it forms through a non-classical carbocation. So basically, you have uh, this pi bond going to carbon, carbon attacking nitrogen, pi bond going to O, but nitrogen has a lone pair, so it will attack this carbon again. You will get a three-membered ring with a plus charge, and uh, here the minus comes back and the Cl minus leaves. Again, you get a plus charge on nitrogen. The Cl means will attack with SN two and SN one character, and you will get this Markovnikov product. The next one is addition of molecular hydrogen. This we've already discussed in alkenes. Addition of hydrogen. Now comes some oxidation reactions. Now in oxidation reactions, first is the combustion reaction, which we know for any hydrocarbon, it will give you CO two and water. So this is the balanced equation. If you think it's, I'm going a little fast. You can pause it again and see it again. The next and a very important reaction is called ozonolysis or the Craigie reaction. So here, on addition of ozone on double bonds and subsequent hydrolysis of the ozonide formed, this process is called ozonolysis. So you have an alkene, you reacted with O3, you get a stable intermediate called ozonide. Which on further hydrolysis with or without zinc will give you some products. With zinc, it will give you a ketone and an aldehyde. Now this is the logic you have to use. And please understand this. Suppose you have carbon double bond carbon, right? Let's say you have two R's here. They are different. Here you have one R. If you want to understand the product of ozonolysis, this is what you do. You break. Every bond between carbon carbon, sigma, as well as pi, and for each each bond breakage, give one one OH to this carbon. Remember, this is not the way it happens, but this is the way you can make the product. So, don't you think this carbon, since two bonds are broken, will get two two OH? Same for this, and you know that when a carbon has two OH, they will go as water and give you a double bond O, which is why you get this. But this happens only if the second step uses zinc. Water will anyway be used, but if you zinc use zinc along with H two O, then you will get aldehyde. Because what happens is if you don't use zinc, one of the byproducts of hydrolysis is H two O two. Now, if zinc were not used, this H two O two, being a weak oxidizing agent, will be able to oxidize the aldehyde to Acid. So you won't get an aldehyde or a ketone. You will get acid and a ketone. Ketone it cannot oxidize. It's a mild oxidizing agent. It can oxidize the aldehyde. You will get an acid now. But if you use zinc, zinc will use up the H two O two. The H two O two will end up oxidizing zinc instead because zinc is more oxidizable, higher oxidation potential, and it will leave the aldehyde alone. So if you use zinc, you will get an aldehyde. If you don't use zinc, well, you're gone. Now, what will happen if there are two H in this? Well, again, if you use zinc, you'll get formaldehyde. Don't use zinc, you'll get formic acid. This is how you get the product of ozonolysis. Now, when ozone is passed through an alkene in an inert solvent, it adds across the double bond to form an ozonide. Ozonides are explosive compounds and they are not easily isolated. But on bonding with zinc and H2O, ozonides cleave at the site of the double bond. The products are carbonyl compounds, aldehydes, and ketones, depending on the nature of the alkene. This is the mechanism. You have an alkene, you have ozone. 
pi bond shifts to this carbon carbon attacks o pi bond goes to the top o the o minus attacks this carbon you first of all get a very unstable intermediate like this this is called the mol ozonide remember this is not this this is different this is called a mol ozonide now this mol ozonide breaks homolytically this bond between the two oxygen goes to this oxygen leaving both of them as radicals the cc bond makes this cs radical and the c radical and the o radical will form will form a bond right and then this bond goes to this carbon this goes to this o now what will essentially happen is both of these two os have dots and their bond with each other will be stronger bond so these os will join this bond breaks this o gets two dots these carbons have two dots so the o with two dots will form a bond with this this is how you get a ozonide now what will happen is they will further break now this bond will break giving you two dots these two bond breaks two dots the c dot and the o dot will form a c double bond o and now this o has a double dot it's a oxygen atom oxygen atom now it will react with h2o it will break the oh bond homolytically this o remember has two dots one dot it will join with h one dot will join with o giving you h2o2 now the product of ozonolysis depends on what we treat the ozonide with so ozonide if it is undergoing hydrolysis we say that if you use things like zinc etc we call it reductive reduction of ozonide call is called reductive ozonolysis oxidation of ozonide is called oxidative ozonolysis now you can do reductive in two different ways you can use uh, zinc in with water or simply dimethyl sulfide triphenyl phosphine h2pd in which case you will get aldehyde and ketone if you use lah and nabh4 instead remember it will convert the aldehyde and the ketone into alcohol now oxidative ozonolysis you simply use water or you use h2o2 or you use a peroxy acid or ag ag or hgo aldehydes will become acids ketones won't so i want you to do the following examples again pause the video as the example is given make the product and play the video back so what do you think will be the product of this remember it is reductive ozonolysis obviously you will get one ketone and the right one will become aldehyde acetaldehyde and butanone okay what do you think will happen here if i don't use zinc i'll get the ketone but the aldehyde will become acid i'll get acetic acid what will happen here so i'll get acetone and i'll get formaldehyde and what happens if it is without zinc the formaldehyde will become formic acid what about benzene while drawing the ozonolysis product of benzene make the double bonds localized it will be easy it will break from here it will break from here it will break from here so won't this carbon become cho this also becoming cho each carbon is becoming cho and two chos are joined to each other won't you get this it's called glyoxal this is called glyoxal what happens if you use toluene well if the double bond is here now these two will become glyoxal these two will become glyoxal but here this will not be glyoxal we call it methyl glyoxal 
Okay. Okay. Now, the next one. What do you think will happen? Pause the video. Obviously, you get three methyl glyoxyl. Okay. What about this one? Now, make sure that you put the double bond in all positions. So, if you put the double bonds here, here and here, this breaks, this breaks, this breaks, right? So, here you will get something like this, right? And these two will become, this will be glyoxyl, this will be glyoxyl. But if you put the double bonds in between, you will get methyl glyoxyl. You will get methyl glyoxyl, you get glyoxyl, you will also get, this is called diacetyl. Of course, I am not writing the uh, coefficients here. What about this one? Pause and make. So, I get uh, acetaldehyde and glyoxyl. Okay, what about this one? I'll get this. Now we talk about oxidation with strong oxidizing agents. Here we're going to use KMN4, etc. Again, remember it's very simple. Again, use the same logic as ozonosis. There is a slight difference. If you have two R's, you have a R and a H. These strong oxidizing agents like KMN4, K2, Cr2, etc. will behave just like oxidative ozonosis. Break this. This forms ketone, this forms acid. Oxidative ozonosis, remember. The only difference is, if it has 2H, it will not only break a pi bond and sigma bond giving OH, OH, it will break these two as well, giving OH, OH, which means the terminal CH2 will always be CO2. That is the only difference. So, alkenes are readily oxidized to acid or ketone by treating them with acid permanganate or acidic um, dichromate. If formic acid is formed, it is further oxidized to CO2 and water. However, no further oxidation of ketones will take place. For example, look at this one. You take hot alkaline KMnO4 or acidified KMnO4 or acidified dichromate. What do you think will be the product? Pause the video now. It will break the pi OHOH. -OH. Sigma OHOH. -OH. Any CH OH. So this carbon ends up getting 3 OH. This gets only 2 OH. This forms a ketone. This forms an acid. Try this one. What do you think will happen here? Pi, OH, OH. Sigma, OH, OH. This guy has 2H. That will also become OH, OH. So this carbon gets 4 OH, meaning CO2. This becomes, this remains as ketone. So you get acetone, heat, CO2 and water. What do you think will happen with benzene? Remember we used to use glyoxyl with reductive ozonolysis. Here we will get oxalic acid. The glyoxyl will further oxidize. Toluene. Well, you will get a glyoxylic acid and oxalic acid. What about this one? Pause, make it and play. You will get this one. What about this? Remember you have to put the double bond in all positions. So one option is this, if the double bond were to exist between the two carbons having the CS3, sorry, if the double bonds did not exist here, if the double bonds were here, then you will get this one. But if the double bonds existed here, you will get these two. Then comes what is known as dihydroxylation. Now, we have seen uh, how KMN4 acts, the hot alkaline KMN4. We have another way of doing the reaction with cold KMN4. And that's called a Bayes reagent. And a very useful reagent at that. The Bayes reagent reacts only with alkenes and alkynes. 
whereas hot KMF4 can react with a variety of compounds, alcohols, aldehyde. So Bayer's reagent being cold KMF4, it's violet in color. And if it, if the violet color disappears, it means the what you're reacting it with is an alkene or an alkyl. So it's actually a test. Secondly, what it does is the hot KMN4 broke the pi bond and the sigma bond to give OHOH. Whereas the cold KMN4 only breaks the pi bond to give the OHOH. Meaning you will get a dihydroxylation. That means 2 OH on the vinylic carbons. Dihydroxylation is the addition of 2 OH groups to an alkene. So basically you get 2 OHOH. And dihydroxylation can be done either as syn or as anti-addition. The syn dihydroxylation is when, when the OH comes from the same side. This is called Bayer's reagent, cold KMN4. Alkenes when passing through dilute alkaline 1% cold KMN4 decolorizes the pink color of KMN4 and gives the brown precipitate of MnO2. It is an example of syn addition. So you have an alkene, you have cold alkaline KMN4, you get this. Let's do a couple of examples and then we'll do the mechanism later. Again, it's not important to learn the mechanism. I'm just giving it so that it becomes easy for you. I want you to make this TU chemistry. So the two OH will come from the same side. Sawhorse. Now rotate so that the two MEs come down. Make the fissure. You get meso. Can you see it's a stereo-specific reaction? One particular stereoisomer gives you only one particular stereoisomer. Okay, what about this one? Again, you'll have two OH and both of them will be on the same side. Check out the mechanism. Again, it's not a big deal. You don't have to learn it. This is MnO4 minus. Pi bond, this shifts to O, attacks carbon. Pi bond shifts to C, attacks this O. Pi bond shifts to Mn and you'll get this is how the two O's are att 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 attaching from the same side. Then on hydrolysis, it attacks manganese and this goes to O. And then this will be an equilibrium uh, intramolecular proton exchange. The H goes to one of the O's attached to carbon. And uh, this comes back and this leaves. So you get an OH. Same process repeat. And again, minus comes back and this goes here. And you get this along with this within the presence of H2O will become MnO2. Which is, this is dark green color. This one. And this is brown. So that is how the reaction takes place. But again, as I said, mechanism is not important here. Then you have uh, another way of doing syn hydroxylation is by osmium tetroxide. Osmium tetroxide adds to alkene to form cyclic osmic ester, which can be made to undergo ready hydrolytic cleavage as their OSO bonds to yield with diol. Not important to learn these things. Just remember the product. First we treat with OSO4, then NaH, SO3 and H2 hydrolysis. You get this. I'm still giving you the mechanism, but not required. So, osmium tetroxide is just like MnO4. Same logic occurs. And do the hydrolysis. Same process. Now here the only point is, the disadvantage is that osmium tetroxide is Expensive as well as poisonous. However, this method can be overcome if by using it in catalytic quantities in association with H2O2 because the H2O2 will reoxidize this back to OSO4. Now, there is a way of doing antihydroxylation. But for that, you first need to make an epoxide. First of all, convert the alkene into an epoxide. How do we do that? There are two ways of doing that. One is simple oxygen. Take half O2 means one O. AG and heat, you get epoxide. 
Now alkenes react with oxygen in the presence of Ag catalyst at 250 to 400 to form epoxide. The second reaction is called the Prilichev's reaction, which is basically going to use a peroxy acid. When an alkene is treated with peroxy acid and epoxide is formed, such epoxidation is known as Prilichev's reaction. So you have an alkene, you have a peroxy acid. And what will happen is one of the O's goes to the two carbons, in between the two carbons and carboxylic acid is released. We need to of course know this mechanism because we need to know which oxygen is going. The mechanism is like this, this is alkene and this is your peroxy acid. Remember it's not carboxylic acid, it's peroxy acid, O bond. Now, this bond, this pi bond between C and O goes between O and H. This bond of OO goes between C and O. So, and then this carbon, this pi bond of carbon carbon goes between C and O. And this bond goes between C and O. So, essentially, you will get this kind of a thing. And then perox epoxide and carboxylic acid. So, remember the O that is going between the two carbon atom is the one that is attached to H, not this one. And uh, one of the very common reagents used for uh, epoxidation is called MCPBA, metachloroperoxybenzoic acid. And you can even use peroxy trifluoroacetic acid, uh, but any peroxy acid will do. So let's do a couple of examples. So suppose I have an alkene, I do MCPBA, what do you think will be the product? Epoxide. Alkene, and remember when there is an option, when there is limited supply of MCBBA, the alkene that is more substituted, the one which has more hyperconjugation, is the one that uh, forms the epoxide if it is limited supply. So, say for example, I have one equivalent of this. So, which a double bond is substituted more? The right one. That becomes epoxide. Of course, benzene won't become epoxide. Only the, this is the, the, the molecule is called styrene. You will get the epoxide here. And if it is like this, well, the epoxide can form both on top and bottom. So, you will get two isomers. And if you have this peroxy acid, remember this O18 will never go for the epoxide. And this will remain with a carboxylic acid. But if the O18 were to come on the OH oxygen, that will be in the epoxide. What happens if I have three double bonds and only one equivalent? Obviously, the more substituted double bond, that is the middle double bond. More substituted alkenes undergo epoxidation faster. What about this one? Obviously the corner one. Now, once we form the epoxide, how do we get the dihydroxylation? We do hydrolysis. Now, epoxides can undergo hydrolysis in two ways. One is called acid hydrolysis, another is called base hydrolysis. Now, please understand, epoxide is a unique compound in the sense, it is basically an ether. COC. The difference is, that not only is there a bond COC, the two C's are also joined to each other, which never happens in an ether. In an ether, it is R, O, R prime. The two R's are not joined. I mean, even if they're joined, at least those two carbon atoms are not joined. But if those two carbon atoms are also joined, it has to be a three-membered epoxide. So that is where epoxide differs from other ethers, number one. Number two, epoxide has three-membered ring, which is extremely unstable. So epoxide is one of those rare ethers that can react with base also. Generally, ethers are susceptible for reaction only with acids, not base. But epoxides can be cleaved with base also. And that is what we are about to observe. Alright. To acid catalyze hydrolysis, you have the epoxide here and um, the H plus is attacking catalyst. First, this gets protonated. Water attacks, SN2 with SN1 character. 
you will get uh, this product releases h plus again since it's a catalyst and you'll get the 2oh whereas if it is base catalyzed it's pretty simple the oh minus will come from this side attack this and form this and this will respond with h2o and this is pure sn2 so remember the attacking oh in the case of acid catalyzed attacked here whereas in the case of base is attacked here so if this were o18 you know if suppose somebody said okay you have this alkene and there is an epoxide here now if this is o18 what will happen with uh, acid catalyzed hydrolysis and what will happen with base catalyzed hydrolysis remember in acid catalyzed hydrolysis water attacks this carbon and this breaks so the o18 will come to the terminal carbon but with oh minus it attacks this carbon and this breaks meaning o18 will come to the middle carbon so be careful on that the next set of reactions are called substitution reactions allylic substitution which we've already done so we're not going to do it again when alkenes are treated with cl2 or br2 at high temperature and pressure one of their allylic hydrogen is replaced by halogen atom remember we used nbs in this allylic position is a carbon adjacent to one of the unsaturated carbon atoms it is a free radical substitution reaction already discussed then let's look at polymerization now many molecules of the same compound unite with each other to form a long chain polymer and this long chain molecule having repeating structure units is called a polymer and the starting symbol is a monomer so let's take a look at example you have ethylene and at temperature high and pressure high you will get polyethylene and you can always get um, this in various ways of addition that we'll discuss in polymers molecular weight of polymer is simple multiple of the monomer polymerization can be carried out by free radical or ionic mechanism the presence of oxygen initiates free radical mechanism and if you want to have ionic mechanism you use a catalyst called the ziegler natta catalyst and we will do the de details of this when we do polymers then we have isomerization well a, an alkene can be isomerized to both chain and positional isomerism with alcl3 at 500 to 700 degrees celsius so you get uh, butene becoming butene as well as isobutene and that completes this long video of physical and chemical properties so that's it part 2 is over very big part uh, but of course i did go through the reactions a little bit faster but you can just pause along and uh, if you are watching this on youtube uh, very soon the site will be up and running chemistryinverse.com and from there you can even download the pdfs so once it is done i'll be announcing that in the video itself and if you are already watching it here you can download the pdf and uh, using the pdf and the notes that you make first make the note just don't download the pdf and read it make the notes while watching the video and then whatever you miss out or whatever you think you don't want to write since it will be already there in pdf you understand the video and maybe then you can use the pdf because the problem is that uh, when i give you a question and ask you to pause it and uh, uh, make the product and then check if you already have the pdf you won't make the product because it's it's already there so you will miss out on that you will miss out on the learning part of it so make sure that you learn through the video and pdf becomes uh, a tool to help you you know sort of get uh, everything that was said in the video in the form of a written book or maybe even uh, a pdf that you view on a tablet or a computer So with that said this is Kalyan Kumar signing off have a great and wonderful day and thank you for watching this